Hey everyone, uh, sorry about the few minute delay. Uh, thank you so much for joining me. I'm here with David Baer. Today we'll be talking a little bit about Senate Bill 410. Um, we were expecting Dr. Patrick Bolin and Gabby Bondia to also join us, but due to uh, the uh, social reform unrest and the protests that is occurring downtown as we speak, uh, I'm pretty sure they are uh, preoccupied with those uh, equally important issues. Today we are talking a little bit about Senate Bill 410, which happens to have a, a matter of urgency. Uh, once it lands into the government, the governor's desk sometime this month, it could be effective as early as July 1st. So the clock is ticking on uh, people to be aware of what the implications of Senate Bill 410 bring and what you can do right now uh, if you wish to stop it. So let me introduce David Baer to all of you. David is the managing attorney at his own firm, Baer Legal Solutions. He's also the president of Save Rural Seminole. It's a community organization here in Seminole County that is dedicated to proactively addressing both immediate and long-term threats to the voter approved rural boundary in Seminole County. Uh, Save Rural Seminole's mission is to educate and empower residents and community partners to take actions which preserve and protect this boundary. Uh, Senate Bill 410 would effectively dismantle the rural protections for Eastern Seminole that voters overwhelmingly placed into the county char charter in 20, um, sorry, in 2004. So again, this has direct implications to David Baer's organization, Save Rural Seminole, uh, and, and it has implications statewide towards natural lands and their protection and how growth management, quote unquote, uh, will look like once this bill is passed, if it is passed. So David, welcome. Thank you very much, Mark, for, for having me and for uh, you providing a, a platform to uh, address this very important uh, potential legislative development and um, you know, to inform and educate people about what it is and what it would do. And, and how they can you know, have a voice in the process. Yeah, and for those of you who don't know what Senate Bill 410 is all about, it will essentially mandate every local government in Florida to include an unnecessary property rights element in its comprehensive plan. Um, and it'll undermine the authority of many county governments to protect rural areas from development. Um, essentially, David will actually discuss what this will look like, but in my understanding is that developers will directly deal with city officials rather than county officials uh, when it comes to lack of um, Senate Bill 14 would promote MCOR, which also stands for Multi-Use Corridors for Economic and Regional Significance, and it also will previously approve uh, and build out developments of regional impact to be modified. Uh, it will allow a party to develop, I'm sorry, it will allow a party to a developmental agreement and local government to amend or cancel that agreement. So David, we'll talk a little bit about the legal implication, uh, implications here. Sure. Um, so I, I sort of preface this with, this is the kind of, you know, sort of uh, boring minutia that some people glaze over on because it's not as, as sort of interesting or fun or sexy as like, you know, being out in wilderness and holding, you know, wildlife in your hand and seeing the deer run and, and feeling the cool breeze. And, and that stuff is like, that's why we care about this. And right. so sometimes that's easier to like um, uh, in, ingest and, and internalize. And however, unfortunately, sometimes, um, you know, things are working in the background, which can undermine, um, you know, in a way that you're not aware of everything that you're trying to fight for on the ground and that you care for. And this is sort of a classic example of that, um, you know, some, you know, what I would, from my perspective, consider nefarious actors trying to, you know, work through Tallahassee, you know, to undermine our local efforts to preserve what we care about. Um, that is sort of in a non-technical, uh, you know, non-legal you know, you know, jargon, sort of summing up what's going on with this bill. So uh, how is it doing and what is it doing? So Senate Bill 410 started its life as 
and basically a property rights uh, bill. Um, and so yeah, we've all watched in, in high school the you know the video about how bills become laws. And 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 to some extent that's you know still fundamentally true. And so you have the House that passes a bill and with certain language and then it goes to the Senate you know, to either pass as it is or to change the language a little bit and they can go back and forth to reconcile if they both pass it but in different forms. And and that's what was happening here. And the original format again was was about preserving property rights. And so it was you know, obligating local governments to write in you know, to their you know, procedures and charters, uh, preservation of, of homeowners' you know, property rights. You know, a lot of people would say it wasn't really necessary. It doesn't really change, you know, the legal rights of anybody. Um, just sort of giving, uh, you know, lip service or political cover to what was already there. But nevertheless, that's what it was about. Um, and it didn't really change too much, you know. Nobody got too up in arms about it. Um, people, there were people who weren't happy about it. But it wasn't, it wasn't, you know, ground changing. At the last minute, however, um, you know, there was some language slipped into it. Um, mm. You know, some lobbyists involved. You know, some lobbyists who were connected to you know, senators were involved, and they they put some language in into Senate Bill 410, which substantially changed what it was. You know, so at that point, the bill was no longer just this, you know, preservation of property rights. Um, you know, sort of not really changing things substantively. Instead, it very much changed things substantively, um, you know, in favor of, of a certain few people around the state. Um, and so one might want to connect the dots as to, to how it came to be. Um, but so this new change that was slipped in after it had gone back and forth a couple times um, required there to be a change in basically who controlled land. And so what this change did is it said, in the past, under the Florida State Constitution, you have what are called charter counties and non-charter counties. Charter counties have rights to determine how their land is used. And mm -hmm. so basically, counties being bigger than cities, um, counties are allowed to plan how they want you know, their land to be used. Mm -hmm. You know, county-wide, we want this land to be used for you know, this type of density, that land to be used for that type of density, this land to be used for um, you know, preservation, you know, natural lands, this land to be used for, you know, commercial, industrial, on and off. Sure. Um, and, and because counties have a larger scope, you know, they will, uh, sometimes at least consider things that are important to the little people, um, like conservation of, of public lands. And Seminole County has done that. They did that through the rural boundary, which is public, sorry, public referendum in 2004. Mm -hmm. Um, Seminole County has, you know, a firm on the rural boundary. Um, and again, that is a Florida state constitutional uh, procedural requirement that charter counties get to do that. And specifically the language that's used is when there's a conflict. So say there's a, a county land which um, is annexed to the city. So then the county and the city both have jurisdiction over it. The county, if it's a charter county, gets to determine the conflict of laws, mm -hmm. right? So what this bill does is it switches those around and it says for land use zoning, when there's a conflict, a city gets to decide what's done with the land. And so what is the practical implication of that? Well, Seminole County is ground zero for the practical implication of that. Again, much, which might tell you who's behind you know, this legislative change. Um, and so if the county has a land use uh, zoning, let's say hypothetically, the rural boundary, which says you can have five or 10 you know, acres per house. And then a city annexes the land, let's say hypothetically, Oviedo annexes hypothetically Rivercross, then the city gets to determine the density of that land. And, uh, and the counties, you know, uh, vote a referendum in this case, but whatever your know, guidelines the county is using, it goes by the wayside. And so it is an avenue basically for uh, developers who can't um, convince the bigger government of the, the county to do what they want done to instead chip off um, land for development by working with colluding with, you know, municipalities, cities uh, to get to get their you know, development density goals. Yeah, I agree. I wanted to actually pull up 
a standard uh, image showing that there are 20 uh, counties in Florida that actually have a charter form of government. So it's not unique to Seminole County. Much larger counties like Orange and Osceola, as well as Volusia in our neighbor, neighborhood uh, immediate vicinity are being affected by Senate Bill 410. Yeah, you know, we're not not alone here. Um, it, it clearly is targeting us, um, but you know, there are multiple counties. Just um, it's sort of getting in the weeds a little bit, but the the bill goes even further in in sort of targeting Seminole County even more, and that it carves out an exception for very large counties. So, um, you know, Miami Dade County, it, it doesn't apply to. Um, it just coincidentally applies to that little sliver of Seminole County. Really? Funny how that works out. Huh. <laughs> a couple other counties, but you know, um, it, are you are you essentially saying that there is language in in the bill itself that is targeting Seminole County above other counties? Uh, so I think the threshold is seven hundred and fifty thousand residents. Um, so yeah, there's a, a threshold that if the yep. Uh, this subsection does not apply to a charter county with a population in excess of 750,000 as of January 1st, 2020. So a number of large counties, it doesn't apply to. All right, um, exactly. it to counties that the, the people that were behind the lobbying are interested in, which is seven and counties. Is, and is this one of those line items that was slipped in during the development of this bill? Yeah, so you have a whole provision, uh, which is would be subsection 11 of the statute. And that's one of the sentences in subsection 11. Uh, none of that was in there before. Really? This whole subsection is all new. Oh, uh, wow. Of the <laughs> updates. So January 29th, the version of the bill, this section is not in there. March 2nd, which is the next version, it was in there. So, you know, Right, right in that change, and I don't know the number. I think that was like say the the fourth iteration of the the bill. The bill, yeah. uh, the the lobbyist and and the senator that put it in there uh, decided, mm -hmm. oh, you know, slide this in here. And and interestingly, I'll say from having having spoken to some of the the legislators involved, they they weren't even aware. A number of them, you know, who voted for it, weren't even aware of the change, mm -hmm. um, which you know sounds horrible, and and. And you know, the, somebody in that position is nobody to blame them themselves. But, but practically speaking, there's so many bills and so many you know uh, paragraphs that that every le you know legislator can't read everything. You know, they rely upon you know summaries and their aides and stuff. And so, mm -hmm. uh, there are uh, the representatives who voted for this, who, when confronted afterwards, said, I "I'm sorry, like I I screwed up. Like I thought." I was voting for what was fundamentally the same bill that I voted for originally. And I was mm -hmm. not aware that this, you know, real fundamental change you know, happened. Mm -hmm. In fact, David Smith, our local uh, house rep, uh, was one of those people who, who basically did a mea culpa. And, and he wrote a letter, you know, to, to Governor DeSantis, um, you know, requesting that Governor DeSantis veto the bill that he voted for. Right. Uh, because yeah. Yeah, he uh, said directly in his letter, I did not intend uh, to vote for the bill in its current format. I, I believe that um, assumed you could say I assumed it was in you know, substantially the same form as it was previously. Wow. Um, so, I mean, it's a real miscarriage of the process to, to basically trick you know legislators into so, voting so for something they were intending to. Yeah, Senator. It sounds like Senator Bill 410 is specifically targeting rural or uh you know uh populations under seven hundred and fifty thousand. so real uh so within those 20 counties that have a charter agreement it's honing down on those uh unpopulated or less populated areas i believe it's monroe county um is another county that was also on a county level you Wow, doing a good job in, in managing rural lands, mm -hmm. and so it, yeah, candidly, it, it's Monroe and Seminole counties that are being targeted by this. You know, throughout wow. the you know, developers in those two areas are wanting to get around the the county's um, you know, somewhat effective um, you know mechanisms to limits and control uh, you know growth in in rural areas. 
Wow. Wow. And for those of you who don't know, Monroe County is in extreme South Florida, and most of the county is uh, part of the Everglades National Park. So, um, you know, it's interesting to state that because uh, South Florida has seen huge issues when it comes to water flow uh, through the Everglades, uh, you know, and originating as north as Kissimmee, uh, you know, the Shingle Creek, the headwaters of the Everglades. So it seems to be a water conservation issue that is also at stake with Senate Bill 410 because it deals with development. Yeah, and I, I, I might have to give me a call, but I, I couldn't swear it was Monroe. It, it might be another county. There, there's one other county in the state yeah. that um, you know, is clearly specifically being targeted. Um, okay, yeah. And, yeah, and don't, don't, don't quote me on the Monroe, but there, there's one well, other. It, it is unfortunate because I feel that, uh, especially the our more rural counties, are the gems of the Florida Native Plant Society because vast tracts of natural pristine land is where we find some of the most rarest and endangered uh, plants. And many of us do not know this, but Florida is ranked seventh highest in its plant biodiversity in the entire country. Uh, it is the only state that bridges temperate to tropical climates. It has a huge uh, representation of federally, as well as state level endangered plants. Uh, some of those are endemic, which means that they're found nowhere else on earth. Um, there's a huge uh, issue here also with people that admire our native plants, that want to garden with native plants. And it's a very strong message that is trending right now uh, to promote and bring awareness to Florida native plants. Uh, but this is, uh, like David said, it's not a very se sexy subject, you know, but it has direct implications on what we find pristine and, and what we classify as natural Florida. Yeah, so there's lots of coordinated efforts across the state to, you know, not just do piecemeal things here and there, but to, you know, interconnect habitats, wildlife corridor, you know, projects like, you know, these are smart preservation techniques. And, and oftentimes you need larger scale uh, uh, governments to be doing that. And that's what counties are, you know, certainly more than, than cities. And then reality is that when you're dealing with county commissioners as opposed to city commissioners, you're this is certainly not disparaging any city commissioners, but you know, you're dealing with people that are, you know, more, more professional, more sophisticated. It's a full-time job. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so it can be more difficult to trick them, you know, for right. to trick them. Right. Uh, right. To do something other and you know, more nefarious. They're, they're sort of, they've been around the block a few times. Like mm -hmm. normally you might be a city commissioner before you're a county commissioner. Correct. Uh, so, you know, it, it's pretty well understood that these city commissioners are, are easier targets, you know, for the developers. Um, right. the, you know, looking at the the present situation here in Seminole County, you know, there would be threats from three cities. Um, the most pressing threat, and indeed the one that you know, through which the um, uh, the the most immediate development would be done through, is the city of Oviedo. Right. And, um, uh, the presumption until recently had been, well, if, uh, you know, a hypothetical developer went to the city of Oviedo and said, well, you know, this 600 plus acre parcel, you know, if I annexed it, would you, um, you know, override the rural boundary zoning? Um, the thought was that would be a three to two vote, but, but now the, the thought is that would probably be a four to one vote in favor of doing so. So, you know, the local Oviedo, um, you know, government, and, and those in charge of it, uh, other than, than one, uh, almost certainly would be uh, you know, pro-development here and, yeah. and allow you know, the developer of, of River Cross to put his, his uh, development there, despite the fact that it's a, a flagrant you know, abuse and, and ignoring of the, the rural boundary standards that the, the Seminole County voters enacted. Um, so that that's the goal that's what they're trying to do right right and it's uh as the map shows that david provided Oviedo is the closest city um i believe there are one two three four six cities or seven cities in seminole county and Oviedo is the one that is right up against that rural boundary line as you can see so, so there's three cities 
and as you can see here, um, these are the, the southern side of an Oviedo, and you get winter springs sticking out there um, up by Lake Jessup. But then if you go up above Lake Jessup, you know, you have Sanford. This is actually, I think, the 2004 map from, from when the rural boundary was first put in. And so there's a subsequent slide, which is, um, you know, shows the city pushing out a little bit further to sort of show the, the progression of things. Um, and if you can go back to the first slide, um, mm -hmm. so the history of the rural boundary is, is important to sort of illustrate the importance of this. And so if, if you go back and you talk with the people who were involved with the rural boundaries creation, um, one of the, the very primary reasons it was put in is because you, you see the little, you know, winter springs purple sliver there. Yes. That, that was actively pushing out like, a. Uh, since we're on, you know, the the plant group, that that's like a bamboo shoot in 2004. You know, grow in quickly, and and they wanted a way to shut that down, or else that little tentacle it was going to push all the way out, you know, to to Geneva. You know, candidly, it would it would be there now, but for, mm -hmm. for 2004, the referendum stopping it, and so the, the very reason it went in there was to stop that city municipal expansion because the municipality was going to facilitate, you know, high density growth. Right. Um, and, and that's the very reason it, it wants to be undone. And and the way it will be undone, and I didn't fully flush out the mechanism, is in order for a you know, municipality to annex land, all that's required is really two things. The municipality has to touch that land and the landowner has to request it. And so if there's nothing preventing uh, a piece a piece of land which is adjacent to a city from being annexed, then that homeowner, that property owner just has to make a petition and, and the city says, yes, we would like you to be a part of the city. And however, under the current rules, that doesn't change the zoning uh, because the county determines that. But under uh, the future rules, if SB 410 passed, then the city would be able to do it. And so you might ask, well, why does the city line end where it does? Because you're not saying that the city can't annex land further than than the rural boundary and it's true they can't but why does a city annex further land so they can uh be they're convinced they can make money off of it and they're convinced they can make money off of it if they can have the development that they think will make them money and so that's why in many places here in Oviedo and winter springs they stop pushing out right at the rural boundary it's not a coincidence they stop doing it there because they could no longer you know uh, dictate high dense high density development you know past that line that will change and the high density development will push out can we uh david can you talk a little bit about between, you know sustainable and also preserving a way of life in the rural county because there has to be a balance between access to affordable housing and what are the what are the solutions here because i understand the plight of people that want to build homes and make a make the florida dream come true yeah but also it comes at a price where we destroy land for you know our own personal use and our future generations you know you, you don't get it back once you knock it down and pave it over you know, right. That's the whole, you know, paradox of development. Um, you know, you lose one decision on development and there's no going back. Um, right. It doesn't go the other way. You know, right. you have a decision preserving land and the developers will come back and ask again and again and again. You know, the, the conservationists, you know, might win 11 in a row, but the mm -hmm. developer wins 12. But anyway, it, your question is a really, really very important one. It, and it actually ties in with the current, um, you know, you know, issues, you know, that we're, we're dealing with and why our, our co-panelists are, are preoccupied um, you know, because affordable housing is is both very real and very important um, and not just in an abstract sense. You know, all of us in, in Central Florida see that, you know, we've seen our, our property values go up, which, you know, sometimes people who own property think, oh, great, my property value has gone up. It's sometimes a little illusory because if you're selling your property, you're probably buying another piece of property, which also has gone up in value. But but either way. Um, you know, where it's seen most problematic, it, not to get into like too much socioeconomic stuff, is, is people who are first time home buyers, which are young people and people who are trying to you know, raise their socioeconomic status. 
Um, you know, they've finally gotten a job that allows them to save some or or have you know stated income to qualify for a mortgage. Um, and so those people, as you know, property values go up, have a harder and harder time you know, buying that house. You know, there are not a ton of hundred thousand dollar houses to buy around here like like there used to be or hundred and fifty. The threshold is much higher. So so yes, it's very important to have affordable housing. Um, and if you look, listen to the developers, they would tell you the only way to do that is to to push the um, the development you know, line out further um, where the land is cheaper. And and while in in a sense, at least on a superficial level, that might sound like a way to do it. Um, there are good reasons why that's not actually a functional way to do it. But even more so, the best way to create affordable housing is to increase density uh, in closer to into the core, you know, the municipal core. In this case, you know, primarily the city of Orlando, but also any any municipality. So, yeah, you know, Maitland, for example, if you drive through Maitland, you're there increase. They've been increasing density there for ten years, mm -hmm. um, which is is exactly the proper way to grow and allow more people to move into Central Florida. Increasing density in the core of Maitland, or if you go downtown, downtown looks very different now than it did 10, 15 years ago, yeah. because there's a bunch of new high rises. Those are not all commercial high rises. In fact, most of them, I would reckon are not. Most of them, if not you know, half of them are, are residential. Mm -hmm. You increase density in, in those residential lands or in those um, you know, urban you know, core lands yeah. instead of pushing out into rural. And going back to why the developer uh, pitch on, well, let's just move out to the rural area and that'll fix it mm -hmm. is not actually fixed because there's a ton of hidden cost in developing out in the rural land. Right. Because, you know, the water doesn't get there for free and the poop doesn't get out of there for free. Uh, <laughs> and you don't, you know, drive in there for free and um, you know, ride the bus out of there for free. All that takes a lot of infrastructure, right. which if you ever look at a municipal uh, budget, uh, is incredibly expensive. Um, right. So who ends up paying for all that stuff? You know, all of us. You know, sometimes right. there are um, you know sort of lip service you know fees and 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 costs you know mm -hmm. apply to developers. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but you know there's a number of studies and, and literature out there showing the true cost of you know, developing out in the rural area, and, and sometimes it's not seen right yeah. away. Um, it's hidden. Correct pushed out and so right. you know the people running the government you know some of them yeah. might not be aware of that but some of them might be aware of it and and are happy to sort of well they're not going to bear that cost until i'm gone so mm -hmm. put it up there now and we'll we'll you know have a huge increase in our tax revenue next year five ten years from now when those municipal bonds you know come due i'll be out of here Right. I, I think you touched base on a very important point is that what we are not, we're turning a blind eye on future repercussions of our current actions. Um, as a young adult, as just like you, I think uh, future generations really have to assess and evaluate what housing will look like, uh, you know, as the current model is not sustainable. Um, if we swallow up all the land, if we are still having metrics show us that a thousand people are moving to Florida per day, um, you know, places that we have a commentary within the Native Plant Society that's almost comical. We have subdivisions called Eagle's Crest and Crane's Roost Landing and Prairie Cove. Those were, those, those were not a single, yeah. <laughs> there's not a single crane. There's not a single prairie community, and there's certainly uh, no ospreys respite or whatever you want to call osprey refuge. There's not a single osprey there. You move there for the allure of natural Florida because you see all those brochures and you see all the beautiful images on, online of what Florida is. It's called the Sunshine State for a reason, but it has deeper environmental appeal. But by building uh, communities like that, you've essentially pushed those uh, aspects of the market, you know, cranes, yeah. it, ospreys, prairie out. Yeah, it, it gets to, um, 
an economist you know would would point out that this is a collective action problem um, or um, you call like a yeah I mean that, that's really the best best way to put it, a collective action problem so you know an individual or a subdivision might move out to that area and you know they're moving there you know, because well in the backyard is an undeveloped you know, tract you know they're you know enjoying well then whoever owns that undeveloped tract wants to do the same and then that undeveloped tract no longer there and so there are no cranes anymore um the cranes have been pushed out you know further and further um so so yeah and that's you know even for you know a republican a libertarian like somebody that's a smaller government person you know there are legitimate purposes of government you know to effectuate you know um resolutions to collective action problems like that um and, and I'm sorry if we're you know getting sort of far afield from the the specific issue, but but that's what it is. It's a collective action problem, and and these are you know legitimate you know purposes of government to help effectuate um, us staying away from the tragedy of the commons, where you know everybody acting in their own self interest results in nobody benefiting in the long term. Um, so you know that's what that's what land use and zoning is all about is is having some coordination you know, for the land mm -hmm. so that it's not just um, a hodgepodge of random stuff, which yeah. you know, rarely, if ever, you know, ends up good, you know, for anybody in, in the long term. Yeah. You know, yeah, in the short term, you know, somebody might end up with, you know, some money in their pocket or, you know, a piece of land that, that has, you know, some, some neat features, you know, to it. But 15, you know, 20, 20 years, 25 years from now, when our kids are here, mm -hmm. you know, that, that's, that's not a, that's not a, if you can move yourself forward to that point in time, that's not where anybody you know, actually wants to be. 100%. And, and there's something called the island effect. You know, um, if you have a conservation island um, species, they slowly disappear because if there is one natural disaster, uh, there's no sort of uh, flow of species from one uh, conservation to the next. So connectivity is very important, very important. Uh, especially here in Florida, because we are so biodiverse. Uh, there are plant communities uh, here in South Florida that are so unique that are not form, uh, found in Central and North Florida. And being in Seminole County, we're in that very special magic area where we have an interplay between South Florida species as well as North Florida species that are gradually transitioning from one to the other. So yeah. we live in a very special area of Florida that is worth protecting. Yeah, I and mean, most people don't know that um, there have been, you know, Florida Panthers found in, in Seminole County. Um, you know, Seminole County is actually a part of, and the rural boundary portion of Seminole County is, is considered a part of, of the, uh, the Florida Wildlife Corridor. Um, and it's, it's an integral part of that flow of genetic diversity you know, amongst those you know, islands or pockets that those islands you know, disintegrate, you know, but for that, um, it's an integral part of trying to save the Florida panther, which you know, really relies upon the, the population expanding beyond um, you know, where it is down there in that little you know, pocket in Southwest Florida, um, you know, the population spreading you know, north um, that has you know, up to Ocala National Forest that really has to come through places like Seminole County. Yeah. County. Yeah, um, I mean, you know, and you know, has something to do about it. That's not going to happen. Um, Seminole County, thankfully, has been responsible, and if we allow them to continue to be responsible, we can continue to be a wildlife piece of the wildlife corridor. So, David, um, I have this image right here. Yeah, good timing. Yeah, and it kind of shows, like, I wish it were not this pixelated, but it kind of shows where the corridor is uh, either being proposed or is already in process of being established. And right here is Seminole County, and you can see the green areas, which are absolutely necessary for gene flow for animals to travel safely uh, you know and avoid human urban development right? so 
you know, these corridors are essential to limit that human animal interaction, uh, especially with our big cats, uh, black bears, etc. Because when there's always interaction, there ultimately and inevitably is some sort of conflict. Uh, and it always ends up on the paper and then, you know, things, everybody has an opinion of it. But if we give the animals some space, um, chances are that they will stay in those natural lands and not bother you um, at all. So um, I get to mark up. So we actually had not talked about wildlife corridors issues at all you know, as being a part of this, this topic. But I just sort of went off on a tangent. And this guy had this <laughs> image you know, in his... Uh, in his wheelhouse, he's able to pull up and slide in there. So uh, that, that's how you know plugged in this this guy is. He he's able to whatever you know random topic comes up. Oh, I got a slide for that. Let me, let me throw it in there. Awesome. Um, <laughs> do you want to talk about your grid here? Can you explain this for Seminole County people? Um, so I believe that's the present 2020 grid. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. If you compare that to the, the first one, which you don't have to go back, but it just shows that the lines are pushing out a little bit other than Winter Springs, which is already you know, up against the um, uh, the rural boundary. But you can see if you juxtapose that with the initial 2004 when it's pushing out and same with Sanford you know, pushing out. Um, yeah, which just you know, goes to show the, the inevitable flow of, of these things. And again, it just takes one adjacent piece of property for a, um, uh, a property owner in the rural boundary that's not annexed to request annexation and, and the city can do it. And like I said, well, right now the, the threat would be Oviedo. It would certainly happen in in Sanford you know, up top. Um, and, you know, the political environment in Winter Springs might be a little different, you know, at this moment, maybe not, but maybe, but in the future, all, all three of them, you know, there's no question would be, you know, violators of what is presently the boundary. Um, Sanford has a huge sprawl just from this map. You can tell how sprawled out it is. Um, and this is Sanford right here in this grayish area. Uh, you know, and it's, like, it's, it's huge. Uh, it's interesting to note, uh, David, uh, because we come from a plant background, Sanford's the only city that has not adopted a fertilizer ordinance. So here in the summer months, uh, in order to protect our freshwater lakes, which Seminole is known for, it's Pride and Joy, Lake Jessup, Lake Monroe, Lake Harney, um, we discourage the use of uh, quick release fertilizers uh, or fertilizer applications during the summer rainy period because it tends to wash off and directly affect uh, large waterways uh, with you. Doesn't really do much good in our sandy soil anyway. Um, you're the expert, not me, but that's my understanding. It's sort of, if you're giving yeah. a rain, it's just going to wash through. Right. Well, and Sanford's one of the few cities that has yet to adopt it, but other cities that are more forward thinking, like Maitland, Altamont, and I think Oviedo as well in Winter Springs have adopted the fertilizer ordinance. So, um, you know, I, I think from a sprawl uh, perspective, this this map really shows uh, the imperative nature of preserving the rural boundary line. And, what's yeah, it like. and while this isn't a map that really shows, you know, densities, um, so it, it probably doesn't perfectly illustrate it. Um, I think it does, you know, sort of touch a little bit on, look, there's land out there, you know, within, you know, the urban core. You know, it, it's a myth, you know, to say, uh, you know, there's no land other than the rural boundary land. You know, it's a bunch of malarkey. Um, you know, just to, to pick up a couple, a piece of land that, that everybody knows about, you know, the Avito Mall, um, you know, put residential there. Um, you know, the, the old uh, Sanford Flea World, you know, put residential there. You know, there's lots of land like that, that right. is really being very underused for what can be, you know, capable residential wise. And right. then there's lots of areas which, which have, you know, good active, residential uses, which could do more. And then you know, the, anybody that has, has had their eyes open the last five years understands that, you know, strip malls and even normal malls, uh, you know, have had a short lifespan. And then, you know, what are we all going through right now? You know, COVID-19, you know, what is that going to do to that inevitable process, you know, expedite it? You know, so there is going to be lots of retail, you know, land that is currently being used as retail 
yeah, which will open up, you know, for residential. Um, mm -hmm. so it's, it's just a myth that's perpetuated by developers who have ulterior motives um, uh, to say that, oh, well, we have to develop out in the rural lands in order right. to have uh, to total malarkey. Right. And, and perception has to change. The, the uh, idea of what a house should be, how, the size, acreage, um, materials, um, that all will change because, uh, and the change is inevitable. If we have this influx of people, thousand people per day, more than that, to the state of Florida as residents, we used to be called a tourist capital, um, but now we're also becoming more and more uh, representative of people that uh, are finding a place to live here. So the perception of housing must change uh, within, a, within, I would say, the next few decades, for sure. Otherwise, um, we'll, we'll be, <laughs> there, won't, there won't be many rural areas anymore. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're not Boston. You know, if you go to Boston and, and you, you walk around Medford or something like that, you're like, man, it, it would take a lot of work to get more density here because everything's already, you know, a three story, you know, house um, and, and they're all crammed in pretty tight. Yeah, of course you could do more because you could convert that to, you know, a, a 15 you know, story thing. So yeah, you could, but, but we're not that at all. We're incredibly far from that. Um, mm -hmm. It's just developers want to, um, to increase their profit margin as much as possible. This is not like, you know, some new tricky game. You know, it, you know people in business you know, want to maximize their profit. Developers want to maximize their profit. They want to maximize their profit by buying land as cheap as possible. Cheapest yeah. land for them is in the rural, um, out in the rural area, in this case, the rural boundary. So they're yeah. going to craft all sorts of creative or maybe not so creative arguments for why, you know, that's in the public's interest. It's just in their interest. That's mm -hmm. Mm hmm. I agree. And uh, David, do you want to touch on the uh, video link right here for econ? That was okay. Yeah. So if you can zoom in there to the bottom, you know, I, I had sent this to you. It wasn't it. It didn't allow me to to PDF it. I apologize. But so move a little east on the map, and then zoom in a little more. There you go. Um, a little more. Um, there you go. So, in there you go. In the the middle bottom left is that little green area, um, right at the what? It's the border between Seminole and Orange County. Oh, right here. Yes, that is the econ wilderness right. area and so people you know watching this probably know where that is because you know we just had that fight um the river cross area is just to the east of that and this is the present you know map that gray or that tan area above it is oviedo and so there you go that's the econ uh yeah econ you know river wilderness area mm -hmm. so just to the east of that is the um is the river cross land and then if you zone zoom out just a little bit, there's there are actually uh, a couple of parcels between the Econ River Wilderness Area. The Econ River Wilderness Area does not actually touch Oviedo, but uh, very very strong rumor has it that the owner of uh, the Econ of River Cross, or I should say the the person who has an option contract right for River Cross, also has an option contract right on the parcels in between river cross and the city of oviedo no way so if you like took a snapshot today and you're like well even if sb 410 passed um it wouldn't do anything immediately because river cross actually doesn't touch um oviedo and, and technically it doesn't but i'll tell you what within three months it will uh <laughs> I, I put a lot of money on that so um like like i said this is these are not you know coincidences or happenstance you know this is all a, a coordinated game uh which is trying to defeat what the actions that we have have uh we as citizens of, of seminole county have made clear we want which is we want to preserve 
you know, the rural area, uh, you know, east of the rural boundary. We, we don't want, you know, developments in that rural boundary, such as River Cross. Two years ago, you know, we, you know, showed up en masse to the, you know, county commissioner's meeting and said, no, we do not want, you know, this type of development mm -hmm. in the rural boundary. And, and they, I don't know, some of them probably begrudgingly said, uh, we better listen to these guys, and they voted it down. And, you know, that developer said, okay, well, let me try something else. Let me file a federal court lawsuit. And, you know, eventually he went to Seminole County and said, hey, you know, I'll graciously allow you out of this if you, you know, give me the Econ Real River Wilderness Area, which, of course, was set a precedent. And so we in mass went to the county commissioners and said, no, absolutely not. Uh, first of all, this Econ River Wilderness Area is precious land, but, you know, this is going to happen over and over again if you allow it to happen. And they... Maybe some of them begrudgingly said, okay, we better listen to these guys. And then this you know, developer said, well, let me try another tactic. Let me go to Tallahassee. And that, that iteration is SB 410. I actually missed another one, which is during all that, two years ago, the same developer went to Tallahassee and tried a similar legislative backdoor effort um, by introducing or having a bill introduced in the House, which would have prohibited uh, zoning limitations such as the rural boundary within, I believe, those three miles of state universities. How many big undeveloped parcels are there in the state of Florida that are within three miles of state universities? Oh, uh, one? <laughs> yeah, Maybe there's more, but you know, there's a, there a very prominent one. It's River Cross. So, you know, this is not even the first backdoor legislative effort by this guy. Um, it's the second one. So you wow. got to pay attention. You got to you know, make your voice heard. Mm -hmm. How do you make your voice heard? Um, you, you write, you, you petition. You know, the easiest way to petition is, is to, to sign uh, you know, a thousand friends of Florida petition. You know, they're sort of have been you know, leaders up there in Tallahassee on this. And so that's an incredibly easy petition to sign. You can, of course, write your own letters. Um, you know, Save Rural Seminole you know, has a letter, you know, on our uh, Facebook page. We, we have posts with other organizations that have written letters, other individuals who have written letters, other businesses, nonprofits that have written letters. You know, you're, you're of course, welcome to look at any of those um, and, and, you know, take parts that, that you'd like. But the easiest thing is what's up there right now. You know, you know uh, fill out the petition, you know, read it, you know, fill the petition and submit it. And, and Governor DeSantis will see the, the massive number of of citizens who are adamantly opposed to this, just like our county commissioner saw the massive number of citizens who were adamantly opposed to them trading away the Econ River you know, wilderness area, and, and they listened. And we can only hope that Governor DeSantis will, will listen as well. I'll also tell you that even if it passes, which hopefully it does not pass, mm -hmm. uh, that, is, that is not the end of the road. So there are uh, judicial challenges to be had, um, you know, to this this legislature, uh, and I won't go into all the the legal reasons for it, but there are I would say you know very strong meritorious reasons why legally you know this bill is is um, is defective, and so if it passes, you you still have something to do. You can stay on your your municipal uh, municipal actors, your commissioners, to uh, stand behind um, the. Yes, Lee County fight never ends. To stand behind uh, challenging this in court, and so I don't bring that up now because that's anything to be done right now. It's not. But if it gets to that point, you know, if you hear that um, that this is passed, um, it's been signed by Governor DeSantis. You know, don't don't say, well, there's nothing I can do about it anymore. There is. You go back to your county, say, fight this in court. Yeah, you know, because you know your job as the county is to stand up for the rights of your citizens. That's us. The citizens have the right to determine, uh, make, put reasonable regulations upon how land is used. The rural boundary is certainly a reasonable regulation upon how this land is used. And so we demand you counties stand up for our rights to make that determination. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was just wonderful. And folks, let's just really quickly navigate through the thousand friends of Florida. Uh, you can find this veto at 1,000 the number 1000fof.org and it's veto sb 410 petition so it's pretty simple um if you want to 
get an overview on M course, which this bill actually promotes. You can uh, learn about that through the Thousand Friends of Florida website. Um, it gives you the uh, task force meeting dates and they're online. So it makes it much more convenient in my uh, perspective to, to attend and to listen in on what they have to say. A uh, Thousand Friends of Florida has done a wonderful job. It kind of uh, breaks down in these bold bullet points. What exactly 410 will, uh, Senate Bill 410 will do if it is signed by the governor. Um, and it could be eminent that it arrives at his desk sometime this month. And it could be signed into law and it could be effective as early as July 1st. Uh, so a Thousand Friends of Florida is essentially trying to get this veto done. So that way we don't have to have this continue on and on. But it seems that the person behind all of this will uh, persist uh, in his or her endeavors to make sure that he or she gets uh, what they want out of it. So this may not be the end of the fight. Uh, I didn't say procedurally, um, you know, how the transmission stuff goes, which I, I won't take but a couple seconds explaining, but you know, just so people understand the process. So once it passes uh, the House and the Senate, it's what's called engrossed, a bill was engrossed. And, and then at some point it's transmitted to the governor. And once it's transmitted to the governor, there's one rule for how many days he has if the legislature is in session and another, you know, if, if the legislature is not in session. And so in this situation, he will have 15 days to make a decision um, once it's transmitted. It has not been transmitted yet. It's been a very long time to, since it was engrossed. Um, oftentimes it probably would have been transmitted, but obviously we've got lots of things going on uh, that has taken his attention. Um, but those things, you know, are, are maybe getting a little bit more under control. And so a lot of people expect for a number of bills to be transmitted soon. Um, mm -hmm. If he does not take any action with 15 days, the, the default order is for a bill to become law. Uh, not that, you know, necessarily the common way for it to happen, but he has to act in 15 days. And if he doesn't, it does. Does. Wow. Okay. You know, have like a line item veto in Florida where, you know, he can veto the specific thing. He doesn't have to veto... Mm. You know, every, all the bills are being transmitted to him. So he has the ability to veto, you know, just this one uh, bill. Right. Right. Well, thank you so much, David. Uh, guys, we've spoken for well over 50 minutes. Um, and oh, David, your, <laughs> your passion is uh, most welcome. Thank you so much for your time and imparting some of your uh, advice, recommendations, and insight into a very complicated bill, uh, you know, quote unquote growth management so um i really appreciate your time as usual and your uh, continued support uh folks uh this concludes today's uh table talk if you'd like to uh donate some uh make a donation to our chapter uh our venmo cash app paypal information is at the very bottom but uh david thank you so much again and uh We'll see you again soon, hopefully not under such dubious discussions. Indeed. Thanks so much. Man. All right, guys. Well, thanks.